CR101radio.com, podcasts, and more. Welcome to the official podcast of the Calcedon Foundation, a think tank for the self-governing Christian. In a time when Christians are looking for answers in revival, rapture, or the religious right, Calcedon presents a comprehensive biblical worldview that calls believers to their covenant responsibilities in order to advance Christ's kingdom in every area of life. Thanks for joining us for this 24th episode of the Calcedon Podcast. Today is June 19th, Father's Day, 2022, and I am joined by Calcedon President and the son of Calcedon's founder, Mark Rushduni, and Calcedon Vice President Martin Salbretti, who in his own right is renowned for his understanding of Rushduni's works. R.J. Rushduni's emphasis on the importance of knowing God's law word and applying it to every area of life and thought is a hallmark of his ministry. Last month, we began a look at his efforts in expounding the first five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, with an examination of Genesis. Today, we are moving on to his commentary on the book of Exodus. So Mark, you above all are not only familiar with your father's work, but you had a consistent personal relationship with him through much of his life and ministry. Your dad didn't write for the sake of writing another book to publish. When he tackled the subject, it was to bring forth aspects of God's word that may have been neglected or forgotten. So from your point of view, what was the motivation behind your father's commentary on Exodus? Well, I think his approach to his ministry as a whole was an understanding that there's a big picture involved. He grew up at a time in the 20th century when Christianity was increasingly moving towards a, an entirely personal view of the Christian faith. It was just you and Jesus, and there was very little application. There was very much little of the big picture. Dispensationalism tended to separate the Bible into different periods, and the, the, the present church age was seen to be very, very small and restricted, and it cut out much of Scripture. And so the whole counsel of God became very important to him, and the, and the, the, the larger picture of what God was doing in history, beginning in Genesis and extending through revelation. He saw it as, as a unity and as one, and he saw that as a very beautiful, magnificent picture of God's work in history and in us. And so this big picture, I think, was very, very important to him. I see. May I add to that, that almost every single chapter, I, I'm not sure I found one yet that doesn't have this, but there are quite, a, almost all of them seem to have it. He will talk about what commentators have said about a text that were nonsense. And so he's doing a lot of clearing the table of uh, accumulated folly and attacks on the word of God. In other words, he has to uh, get rid of all the dirt that's been accreted over the time and that these uh, various expositors and scholars have heaped abuse upon the Bible. Uh, I see it even went into uh, Freud. He had to end up dealing with Freud and Freud's attempts to overthrow Moses and declare Freud to be the person who actually uh, leads the Jews uh, to liberty, not Moses. Even. And so you go through this process and you say, there's a lot of baggage that has been imposed on the book of Exodus, and not just Exodus, but this is what we're talking about today, on the book of Exodus, to make it a stink in our nostrils, so that we say, why would you want to read Exodus, considering what all these scholars have said? So when Dr. Rushdoony clears the table, he substitutes these falsehoods and these false impressions with the truth. So you have this glistening bright light, where before you've been told it was nothing but darkness and, and uh, Hebrew folly. And that's the big deal, I think, to restore the Word of God into its fullness and bring it back to bear. It's almost like when uh, Hilkiah the priest found the law of God in the cleft of the temple wall and brought it to Josiah, something brand new is showing up. And so Dr. Rashtuni's commentary seems to do exactly that. Material of value seems to be coming not from 20th century scholars in his work, 
with a few exceptions like Oswald T. Alice, but usually from 19th and 18th century scholarship where the decline had not yet occurred. So we've inherited a lot of nonsense. And it weren't, if it weren't for scholars like Dr. Reshduni, we would be swimming in it. And so the book on Exodus does a huge service in restoring it to its full authority. Uh, and, and we can have answers for the things that have been declared to be uh, nonsensical or foolish or mythical in it. And Dr. Reshduni sets all that at naught and substitutes the truth. And he defends the scriptures with a, a vigor that's just uh, a glory to see, in my opinion. And so this service alone is huge because most of us are intimidated uh, and cowardly when it comes to dealing with scholarship. You know, we can either throw the weight of God's word around, say, well, God said it, but that might not be satisfying everybody. But to be able to say, God says it, and here's why they're wrong, even on their own terms, that's huge. And I think uh, Dr. Restrini was willing to, to take the effort to not only deal with the big picture that had been lost, but also to the little details have all been smudged out too by scholar after scholar. And so he piece by piece puts it back together. So we are, the picture has no longer been deprived of its truthfulness and it can be passed on to future generations in its full power. So I'm glad that you put it in those terms about clearing the table, because most people, churched people, would say, oh, I know all about Exodus. Then we have the story of, you know, Joseph, and we have the story of what happened after he died, and, and we had all that. So they have like a Sunday school idea. And I think most people, and Mark, you could speak to this would think, okay, Rajuni is going to talk about Exodus, so he's going to talk about the law, because he always talks about the law. But interestingly enough, he starts and ends this commentary with a well-known New Testament occurrence, and that's the transfiguration when Jesus appears with Moses and Elijah in the presence of Peter, James, and John. So why do you think it's significant that he starts and ends the commentary with this account in the New Testament? Well, Egypt to us is just a, a very old word in a very old nation that doesn't really convey much of what it conveyed to people in, in the ancient world. Egypt was a very long-lasting power. Egypt was the, the power in the region of the day. And God, long after Egypt was a, a significant power, particularly in the Middle East, uh, the term Egypt keeps coming back, and God reminds the people again and again, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. And this salvation from Egypt, we have to remember, was a very unlikely event. Slaves don't turn around and form their own nation. Walk, they don't walk out of, of, of slavery and form their own nation. And yet, it not only happened from Egyptian slavery, it happened again about a thousand years later, when after the Babylonian captivity, the Persians defeated Babylon and then allowed the Jews to go back to Palestine, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and they started again. So twice God took an, a nation of slaves and brought them into the land to restart. So the return uh, or the, of the people, the Abrahamic people in the Exodus, and bringing them into Palestine as their own nation, and then again after the Babylonian captivity, is uh, given again and again as an analogy of what God is doing in history. And it's really an analogy of his kingdom. And uh, you mentioned the transfiguration. It represents ultimately the salvation of God. And the core salvation of God, is, of course, is the, the work of Jesus Christ and the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And in the transfiguration, uh, that was referred to uh, when Moses and Elijah were speaking with Jesus. They were all in conversation, and they were talking about one topic. And we're given that in uh, Luke 
as um, his decease, that is the decease of Jesus. And uh, that word for decease can be translated as it's the exodus, the exodus of Jesus. The salvation of Jesus represented what the exodus had represented. It represented what the return to Palestine in the, after the Babylonian captivity, it, it, it meant leaving slavery and entering into the, the realm of God's salvation and the future that God has prepared for those who love him and obey him. So it's, it's a beautiful picture of the salvation of God. And Egypt was a powerful nation. That's why we're, we're told that God had to miraculously defeat the Egyptian army because uh, the Hebrews were no match for them in any way, shape, or form. And they were in no position to return to Palestine uh, under Persian rule. God allowed them uh, to do that. And this, it's the same thing with the salvation of Jesus Christ represented by his atoning work. It's we, we leave a sin, a slavery to sin of which we're powerless to, to correct and to fix. And yet God leads us into a bright future. So it's talking about all the salvation of God in history and a salvation that really an outworking of a salvation that that's still in progress in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God was the primary theme of Jesus. If you go through uh, the gospels, the, the constant reference to Jesus Christ is to his kingdom and what is the nature of his kingdom and, and, and understanding life in the kingdom. And that's where we are today. We can add to that the uh, comments in the book of Hebrews, where the work of Moses is contrasted with the work of Christ. There's similarities, but there are big differences. Moses was the captain leading the people out of Egypt into liberty. Go proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all the inhabitants thereof. It's the climax of that deliverance. But Christ is the captain of salvation for all of us. So this image is uh, repeated throughout the scriptures. It's a liberation. And, uh, but most men want to be liberated from the consequences of sin, not from sin itself. Uh, and this marks, of course, our resistance to what God is doing uh, until we get with his program. But uh, that exodus that uh, Christ was about to undergo in Jerusalem is an important one because he leads a much larger host than Moses through much more difficult circumstances on it personally, the tearing of the Trinity into pieces to achieve it, uh, to deliver his people. And so Moses is in this, well prefigures with the work of Christ. And uh, that's why Moses probably was very fascinated to have that conversation along with Elijah uh, with Christ about the work that's about to be done, which Moses' great work was just a small picture of. So was the fact that it was Moses and Elijah as opposed to Abraham and Samuel, I mean, there, there are plenty of stellar figures in the Old Testament. So you just explained why Moses, why Elijah? They represent the law and the prophets. The law came through Moses, if you will. But the application of the law came through the prophets, starting with Samuel. And they're the ones who actually became God's mouthpiece. Now, from one point of view, Dr. Reshoni says Aaron was the first prophet because he spoke for Moses on God's behalf. And so there's always a voice being involved. And Dr. Reshoni actually ties us all the way to Romans 10.4 about how it's really here if, not, if someone does not uh, you know, uh, deliver the gospel, speak it, preach it. And so uh, the prophetic word has to go out. And so the concept of the law and the prophets together, jointly representing the authority of God, the, the um, revelation of God to mankind for all that he needs is important. So both of them represented the entirety of God's work through the entire Old Testament dispensation. And uh, therefore, they represented the Old Covenant as it was preparing for the New Covenant to cast brand new light on what the Old Covenant was about moving from the shadows to the substance, if you will. And uh, that's an important element. The ethical part stays the same. We, st we still think that the prophets should be quoted uh, authoritatively for today. Uh, their words will not fall, right? The, the um, law and the prophets, 
those words shall stand because of the counsel of God, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand forever. And because they repeated God's words faithfully, even at the cost of their own lives. So it was a testimony sealed in blood in this sense. So that's why Elijah is present. He represents not only the, uh, the prophets, but also, if you will, the line all the way to Christ, because this was the Elijah for whom to come, right? John the Baptist represented and came in the spirit of Elijah, the last of the Old Testament prophets, those who were born of women. And so that's an important thing. So everything is connected together, in, and that's why they were there. And we are not, and I think the important point there is that the intention of Peter and the others was to build three tabernacles, one for each of them, which means they didn't get it. <laughs> they didn't realize that, the, uh, that, that there was a huge transition and that they were doing, putting undue honor on the mere servants and not of the Lord God Almighty, the, uh, the Pantocrat or the Almighty uh, Christ. So there were lessons to be learned even in that situation, because they wanted to see time, as Rosh Hashanah says, suspended right there in that transfiguration. That was a beautiful thing to them, but they, God was sending them on a mission to do work and not just to sit there and enjoy the transfigured bodies in front of them on the mountaintop. Right. Uh, you know, people just like to check out and enjoy things neoplatonically, and our mission is actually labor and work under Christ. Uh, for his kingdom's sake, and yeah. we need to be busy about the, the work, not busy gaping at uh, Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus. Well, I was always thinking, well, you know, three people saw this. Um, he could have had a bigger splash if it was like when he was feeding the 5,000, but I think you sort of answered the question, this wasn't to make them feel good and lackadaisical. This was to it heighten for them post the resurrection, post the ascension, what it is they were supposed to do. That's why they were witnesses to it, not, you know, thousands of people. Right. And of course, them seeing it, it made, brought to mind the fact that, you know, Moses is not among the dead, neither is Elijah. They're obviously alive and well, because they're talking to Jesus right in front of us, which puts the lie to all sorts of notions uh, about death and life, et cetera, that uh, were current, certainly among uh, many people at the time, Sadducees being in particular. This would have shocked a Sadducee to see it, among other things. Right. So, Mark, um, it's customary for people to, if they're even going to give a, um, what do you call it, like an example? Okay, so what people went through, what the, the Hebrew children went through in Egypt is how God refines us and then God delivers us. But too many people look at our transition from slavery and sin to just personal salvation. And yet your father points out in the commentary that as our, our salvation is to bring in and usher in the justice and dominion of the kingdom of God. How does how, how would you explain that to people who this might be a rather new concept for them? What the people were saved from was obviously the slavery from Egypt. And we tend to uh, spiritualize, really return sometimes the word of God into uh, a mystical th thing that we have to uh, uh, apply in, 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 in some vague sense, uh, because we, we don't really see the continuity uh, of God's salvation. And uh, they went to build a kingdom, and they were given very specific uh, standards on how that kingdom was to be organized, how they were, they were to have certain territory in that kingdom, they were to uh, exercise authority in that kingdom. They were given a law for that kingdom. There was a certain unity, obviously religious unity, where they were to worship. The Levites were there to uh, help them and to teach them, that, and they were distributed amongst the land. So they had uh, a certain degree of independence in, in their tribal uh, authorities, and yet they had a common purpose and function and uh, that's a model for they were building something. They were building a kingdom and a nation, a people dedicated to serving God. And that's the same model we have in the kingdom of God. We have where to go out. We're going to go with authority. 
and we're to serve God, and it's it's not a tightly unified organization because it has a spiritual head in Jesus Christ, and yet it has a very common law, law common authority, common purpose under the leadership of, of uh, Jesus Christ, which which unifies it, it all. So there's there's again this this big picture of what God is doing in history and our responsibility in history. The, the people in the Old Testament had covenant responsibilities. What did the prophets tell the people when they had fallen into Baal worship? He says, look all around you. This is happening and that's happening. And that wouldn't happen if you were actually obeying God. And this is ev evidence that you are not, that you violated the covenant. He, could, he obviously could point at the Baal worship. But he said, the fact that these problems exist show that you're not obeying God in any way, shape, or, or form. And if we have a personal view of salvation alone, then our life in the kingdom is basically becomes chaotic. It becomes antinomian. It means that, that we can't build anything together as the people of God. We are acting independently as as Christ used the example of a body you know hand eye mouth they can't they can't work apart from each other and separately from one another they have to act in unity and the unity we have is obedience to to God's law and we're working together in terms of that that law that's the system which creates a unity of purpose and action and direction under the power of the Holy Spirit. So okay. there's, again, it's this big picture of what's happening with the power of God in history and what we're part of. And part of that process, we, looking back at Genesis, realize that this deliverance from Egypt was part of a promise of God, that they would be in Egypt only so long, so many centuries, before they would be called out and restored back to the land of promise. So God's faithfulness was actually on the line the entire time, and there was no expectation, uh, God not having said much of anything for several centuries, of anything happening. So it came as a surprise to a people that were not ready for the responsibilities of liberty. And, but it came because God is faithful to himself. By the same token, there was a, there was a surprise when John the Baptist was born. Uh, God had not said much of anything for the same amount of time, about 400 years, and yet now things are back on track. So God is being faithful to his promises, even when we think that he's winking at them or has forgotten. God never forgets. Right. So we're familiar with the fact that in Exodus, it's the giving of the law. However, and either one of you can tackle this, it's not like there was no law before the Ten Commandments. This was the codified law. What's significant about the fact that it was only after coming out of slavery that these people were given a codified law? Well, for one thing, people had a very definite slave mentality, and we see that in the wilderness. And we see that in the frustration of Moses. They were thinking in terms of what they knew, and they failed to understand the big picture of the salvation that was unfolding before them. Uh, they were understanding things pragmatically, and it didn't make much sense to them. And therefore, uh, they lost that sense of victory that, that God had promised them. They didn't believe, they didn't act in faith, and God let that generation die in, in the wilderness till a generation that had grown up understanding they had to depend on the promises of, of God came that, that, uh, allowed, that was allowed to go into the land. And I think we're very much like that today is uh, we look pragmatically at what's practical. I can remember years ago, somebody, I, we were just passing and we both had to go in the opposite directions but somebody realized who I was and, and they said, Oh, I really appreciate your father's uh, stuff. And then he, as he was walking away, except the post millennialism, I just can't see that happening in the world today. And that's, you know, beside the point, what we can see God doing in history is beside the point. 
It's what God says he's going to do in history. There was nothing that the Hebrews could have seen in their political situation in Egypt that would lead them to believe that they were going to walk out of Egypt and end up in a nation, a nation of their own. Slavery results, revolts just don't happen and or at least have good results. I think the last slave revolt was Haiti, and Haiti's been a mess ever since. Uh, it's very difficult for slaves to make anything of themselves when they revolt. And yet we're in the same boat as the people who are who left Egypt. We doubt what God can do in history, because we just don't see that happening today. And we don't even, in many cases, believe that that's what should be happening in history. We, in many cases, people want defeat because they, they think that's when things are really going to happen. And when all is lost, Jesus will just come back and fix things miraculously. We're really in the same boat as many people in Christ's day. And he said, all you want to see is signs. Is all you want to see. You're following me to see miracles. And yet you have to accept who I am. And we have to accept who Jesus is and what he has promised to do. And we have to believe in his kingdom and, and its victory. Right. You know, uh, it's common for people to say the law was given right there in uh, Exodus 20. So it comes as quite a shock for ch chapters earlier in the 16th chapter of Exodus, where God says, you know, how long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my statutes? Uh, he'd, uh, they'd already been breaking it. How is it possible that they're breaking God's law if it hadn't been given yet? Because it had long ago been given. He's simply going to republish it so the entire people are under no illusions as to what his requirements were. We have it way back in uh, Genesis that God, one of the patriarchs, was commended for keeping God's laws, his statutes, commandments, ordinances, and precepts. But it's repeated right there four chapters before Mount, uh, or at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, whichever you want to call it. And uh, God issuing the Ten Commandments and the rest of the ordinances of the Exodus uh, Sinai Covenant. So what's this doing here four chapters early out of place? It's not acronymistic. It simply means that our uh, assumptions are simply false, erroneous, and lead to wrong conclusions about the nature of the law and when it came into to play, covenantally or any other way, ethically. So... Uh, the word of God itself puts to rest the notion that the law was given uh, and didn't had not been given prior to Exodus 20. It's right there in Exodus 16, verse 28, that in fact, God's already calling him on the carpet for refusing to keep his multiple, not just any, but many statutes and commandments. Uh, the occasion that triggers God's ups upset was, you know, violation of the Sabbath, but there was more to it than that. This is simply what the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, God is not sloppy with his grammar, his terminology, his vocabulary, and uh, his indictments. They're very clear, and uh, we can rely on them and draw proper conclusions from Exodus 16 that will lead us not to make a mistake about what's going on in Exodus 20, as important as it was. But still, the truth is, the commandments were given before Exodus 20. Right. So you've been quite articulate and you bring it up a lot that God in his word says that his law is higher than his name. And that would seem to me to say if people and I hear this a lot, I'm waiting to hear from God. Pastors will tell people to hear God's voice as if God's voice will be different than his law. Do you see that there's a separation between the two, or does God speak through his law? Well, of course, that's a slight difference in uh, what Psalm 138.2 says. Uh, he, he says he's magnified his word above his name, but his law certainly is his word because it's a law word. Everything that God says has legal force because of his authority. Uh, so we start with that point, but do we equate these things? Well, there's a reason why Jesus is called the Word of God. In the preamble to the Gospel of John, it's laid out very clearly. In the beginning was the Word. So that is an important aspect of it. And God, you know, Jesus essentially was not only the Word incarnate, but also law incarnate. So he wouldn't contradict himself. 
we set up all sorts of tensions inside the Godhead. It's a wonder it holds together with the kind of notions we have about it. Uh, fortunately, it is, does not suffer from any of these disharmonious uh, notions that we uh, carry with, our, with us and try to impose upon it because we're smart theologians. Some laymen get it better simply by accepting it as it is than the theologians who are tampering with the nature of God and trying to tell men how he is and what he does and what he can and can't do. But no one can say to God, none can say his hands, right? So that's an important aspect. But I don't think we want to necessarily equate the law, which is the words coming out of God's mouth, but he also is not someone whose word returns unto him void. The law was given for a purpose. And here we're getting on one of my hobby horses is the law was given to be kept, not to be broken billions of times every second like it is currently. So why is it going to persist that way when we're told to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in Matthew 6.10. I think the scholars who've said this prayer, it needs to be done in faith because there's indications in Matthew 5.18, properly understood, that it will actually be happen one day, that the law of God will be kept. However briefly, we don't know, but we know that, that, that it was not given to be continually a, a vain thing, futile, empty, that never gets anywhere, that all it does is condemn. No, the law of God one day will be kept. And that's kind of an astonishing claim, considering how sinful the world is. But that means that Jesus really is the Lamb of God who was taken the way of the sin of the world. And in that progress, we, we have either our faith that that'll happen, or we are faithless and not unbelieving. Uh, and I think the book of Exodus is very useful in this regard because it is a compendium of all the things that Israel refused to believe that God said, and God proved with signs and wonders and miracles and deliverances, and still Israel didn't believe. They saw an ocean rip open by the winds of God's nostrils, and they still didn't believe it, and they still defied Moses. So after the work of what Christ did on the cross, I can see Christians following after the pattern of old Israel, even though we were told that these things were given as examples unto us, both what to do and what not to do, what to think and what not to think. And one thing we should not do, as the psalmist says, is to limit the Holy One of Israel, which, of course, people in Exodus did. They did it when they got to the chapters in Numbers and grumbled and, uh, that, and murmured against the Lord, saying, he brought us out here because there weren't enough graves in Egypt. So here we are eating things we don't want, manna, yuck. And uh, God did not like ingratitude. So there's a lot to be said in this whole picture. Okay. You know, Andrea, so, yeah, uh, yeah. If, I, if I might, uh, a related uh, reference, you mentioned people saying, I'm waiting for a word from God or leading from God, is, is the idea that uh, we're no longer in an era, the era of, of God's law, but we're actually in the era of God's grace, as though law and grace were are opposed and they're not. But they would often use the term, I'm waiting, you know, now our guide for piety, for holiness is no longer the law, it's the leading of the Spirit, okay, which is implying that the Spirit of God would ever lead in a way contrary to the word of the triune God. And so you know you're in a realm of bad theology when it becomes anti-Trinitarian, and you're actually opposing members of the Trinity, that, you know, the Father is, you know, uh, focuses on law, but Jesus is about grace, and the Spirit is about leading somewhere in between, or a third option. And uh, we have a terrible understanding of the, the Trinity and the triune uh, God these days because of bad theology, and uh, and and that's a, a a continuing problem. You hear many things from pulpits today that are are very anti-trinitarian, and this is this is uh, this this is really symptomatic of of uh, the problems in the church today. Mark makes a very very good point here, and I think there's a solution to it laid out among other places in Deuteronomy thirty. Let me quote from this passage. It has to do with exactly this question about God giving us a word. And here it reads, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou should say, who shall go up to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou should say, who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. 
But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. So it's not that there's an absence of the word. In fact, the problem is not that it's absent. It's, it's right here, and it's in our face, and we don't want it. So, yeah. so at this point, you know, God says, there's no reason to say it's far away. I need to go up to the heavens to find it. God's not showing me the way. In fact, God has shown us the way. We don't want anything to do with God's way. We want our way. And uh, our will be done, or this and God's will be done. So this uh, negative orientation of God's law is simply a positive orientation to human autonomy. And it's simply disguised as a contempt for God's law, when in fact it's a contempt for the lawgiver. Yes. So as I was going through sections of this, you know, I had act I actually typeset this book, so people will know now if there are any mistakes, they're my fault. Um, but... I read it as I was doing it, and oftentimes I didn't get through it as fast as I should because I was reading as I went. But one of the things that struck me then, and it strikes, strikes me again now, is Rush's comment that Jesus is the incarnation of God's justice. I don't think most people think about it in those terms. So what do you think that actually means in terms of real life application? Well, certainly, we look at the atonement, which is the center of all history. That is the one pivotal event in history where justice and mercy meet and kiss, where deliverance from sin, which separates from God, has been achieved, and justice has not been broken in the process, but rather been sustained with a strong and mighty hand. We're told in Deuteronomy 16, 20, justice, justice shalt thou do, but men do not do what God requires. But Christ, he brings justice. And he says, and, he, and uh, it's in Isaiah 42, verses 4 and 5, that uh, uh, he shall not be discouraged or uh, fall apart, if you will, until he's established justice in the earth. And that's his mission. And so when he goes forth, uh, conquering and to conquer, which is what he's doing, the conquest of Christ uh, through the Great Commission of making all nations Christian disciples. Uh, he's bringing justice to the world. He's bringing himself. He's justice incarnate in the sense uh, that the, all of God's attributes are incarnated in him. Uh, love and mercy, but also knowledge, wisdom. We talked once uh, in the two of our uh, podcasts back about all these seven spirits of God in Isaiah 11 that all rest upon Jesus that he has in full measure. We have the spirit according to a measure, but him without measure, infinitely so. And so this is true for justice. And every step that he took was to uh, achieve his father's justice in the world uh, so that it would not uh, have to be set aside or overruled. It would be observed and kept to the letter because the word of God cannot be broken, and just God's justice will be satisfied. It's either going to be just satisfied in Christ for our sake or in us because we rebelled and refused Christ. So justice there shall be, and we, it's just a matter of who shall we serve. Moses called them out on it, right? He says, Suzy this day who you shall serve. And uh, that choice uh, still stands before us. And the law of God is the arbiter between where we stand. Will we observe to walk according to his ways or our own ways? Will we make ourselves our own God? Because as Spillwell said, the uh, source of law in any system is the God of that system. And if you're your own source of law, you are your own God. And the true God, he doesn't broach any rivals. Right. So you mentioned before, Mark, that there is no conflict between law and grace. And yet, much of God's law, the Ten Commandments for sure, most of them are stated in the negative because God is creating the boundary between what's acceptable to him and what's not. And one of the problems with, I think, a lot of understanding today is people equate sin and crime. And they're not the same thing, are they? You know, sin is a moral violation. Let's see, our problem before God is a moral one. And um, crime, as we think of it, can take all sorts of different forms. And I can remember hearing someone I respected very much 
describing the, the difference. He says, uh, if uh, you're stopped for going over the speed limit, you don't have to feel guilty. If you're stopped by a police officer, say thank you, officer, you take your ticket, take your punishment, because that's the law. But you don't have to feel that you've necessarily violated a moral offense of God. It's, it's an offense against the state, and there's a penalty to be paid, just like there are rules in a schoolroom or rules of an, in an office, in a company that you're obligated to follow. We follow certain laws of man. But uh, what we, we need to focus on as Christians is the moral law of God and not doing anything contrary to God's moral law. So in that regard, um, especially when you live in a humanistic society or one that's prevailing that in, in terms of that orientation, is it important for those who want to follow and obey God to have crimes match up with sin rather than have them be so separate that you can be penalized for something that's not sin? Well, Isaiah said, uh, woe to them that call you know, evil good and good evil. And, and inverting God's moral order is a very serious offense. And it's uh, not all of God's laws. They rep all represent a moral ethic and a moral standard. Not all of them involve a civil penalty, though, and we do have to remember that. So there's a, uh, there's a sense in which we should believe in a, a limitation to the power of government, and we don't necessarily believe in an all-powerful government that enforces every offense. Uh, we shouldn't exceed God's law and necessarily try to uh, enforce that which is, uh, you know, God is fully capable of enforcing on, on man. God, you know, God has his own built-in penalties when we violate his, his moral order. And I've often used the example, uh, forgive me if I've, I've done it too many times, but if we jump off of a cliff, there are consequences. It's built into God's universe that, they, that it's going to hurt when you fall. Well, likewise, when we violate God's moral order, just as the prophets were constantly pointing out, bad things happen. And they said, this is ha exists in your society. It ought not to. And if you were obeying God's law, this wouldn't exist. The situation wouldn't exist. And so there are those who hate God's moral order, and they don't want the, the necessary laws of man uh, regarding those things to match up with God's law, which is a way of fighting God's moral order. And this came into a very stark contrast early in the book of uh, Exodus, as Dr. Rashtani points out, with the Hebrew midwives. What they did in lying to Pharaoh was a crime. But had they not done so, it would have been a sin. So they had a choice. They had a choice between sinning against God and being accessories to murder or committing a crime against the uh, civil god of the realm, which was the Pharaoh. And they chose to honor God. And so uh, when we're put in that situation, obviously there's a rock and a hard place, but we are to go with God. And whether he saves us or not, as the, uh, Daniel and his associates said, uh, well, God can save us from this furnace you're about to throw us in, but even if he doesn't, we still will not fall bow down to your statue. And so the same spirit animated the Hebrew midwives who were heroes of the faith and mentioned as such in the book of Hebrews and elsewhere because they stood on the principle that true morality comes from God and all other morality that's a contradiction to it is fraudulent. It is a false faith and a false God. And they were willing to take their chances with the true God who can truly deliver them. Uh, and even if not, they still were going to be accessories to murder. Right. So would you say, Martin, that everybody's on an exodus of some sort, one way or the other? They're, they're heading towards either a bright future or a very dismal one. Right. I don't think there's any such thing as standing still in the kingdom of God. Uh, it is a stream moving forward, and we're either going to go with God's flow or we're going to resist it. Resisting God has its own built-in penalties. It's like the, the cliff metaphor that Mark brought up. Mark, are there a lot of cliffs in Vallecito? I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be coming into the conversation more, and you draw attention to it. But uh, the fact that the consequences to our actions is important. 
um, because we make calculations and oftentimes we leave God out of the calculation. And that is the essence of foolishness because then our decisions are made humanistically. And whenever we act humanistically, we actually are siding with the kingdom that can be moved, that will in fact be displaced and, and uh, consumed by the kingdom of God. This is the whole point made uh, in Daniel 2, that the stone cut without hands comes, strikes these things, they become uh, chaff, and then it, it consumes all these other kingdoms into itself. Uh, so every kingdom except the gods is on borrowed time, is on unstable ground. That's why Dr. Rishuni liked to quote from the second verse of Psalm 24, that he, the Lord, has established the earth upon the floods. In other words, on an unstable plane, something that's just moving and just jittery and, and uh, uh, chaotic. He says, because there's not supposed to be any certainty there that you can uh, sink your teeth into and put your feet on. God established the earth upon the flood so that the only safe foundation for anything is God and his word. And so if we try to seek any certainty uh, and permanence in anything but the kingdom of God, we're true fools and our lives will bear the mark of having built on the sand and not on the rock. So as people look at, okay, so do I really need to read this commentary? After all, I've tackled institutes and I, I've looked at the systematic theology. Rashtuni wrote a lot. So why, Mark, should people take the time to go through this how important is it to get the points that he was striving to communicate? Well, I, I think one of the deficiency of modern Christianity as a whole is a deficient understanding of, of much of Scripture. And I think if we understand Scripture, and I've had people who told me, you know, I, I, I got into the habit of, of reading the Bible systematically, a um, long time ago, I've read the Bible through many times, but I never really thought about much of it. And many of the texts I never really understood until, you know, I got into it a little bit more. And especially if I, you know, have a, a lesson on expounding a particular text, this is I never knew that was, you know, involved in that text. And we t tend to have a, you know, a Sunday school perspective on many of the Bibles. It's a series of stories, independent little lessons, almost like Aesop's fables. This lesson has a particular moral morality tale to it, or a good character trait or bad character trait, uh, something we should do or or we should something we should uh, avoid doing. And we don't see the work of good in history, and we don't see the repeated failures of man because they aren't listening to God, and they aren't doing things God's way. And that's a constant. In the wilderness, obviously, the people rebelled against God. They didn't want to move in terms of God's promises. It, he had just saved them from slavery, but they were reluctant to believe that they could go into Canaan. So he said, fine, you can wait until this generation dies. Later, we see that they were willing to obey God in some cases. And the Northern Kingdom, thoroughly involved in Baal worship to, to, until its destruction, never actually repudiated God. They thought they could keep God and yet also worship Baal. Just all they were doing is acknowledging that there were other powers around. Baals represented powers, lords, and other nations recognized that there were other powers, but they never actually re fully repudiated Jehovah wor worship, even though their worship was, was, you know, contrary to God's word. And the, then the same thing happened to the southern kingdom 135 years later. They didn't actually repudiate uh, Jehovah. They just largely ignored the covenant, and they were constantly uh, breaking the covenant, but they didn't want to go to that further step. You know, he would, Jehovah was a Lord. They recognized, yes, 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 we hold him, but we've, we've grown a little bit. We've, we've seen these other powers, and we have to acknowledge them, and they refused to obey him, and so God judged them, and, and we can see that throughout history. We see that in the church today. 
you know, people sometimes when I told, have told people, you know, that the kingdom of God is growing is bigger now than it's ever been before. Many peoples in, in different parts of the world are coming to Christ that have, that has, that hasn't existed in our lifetimes and uh but they, people say yeah they, but they have a lot of bad theology well you read the early church and they had a lot of bad theology too god works around uh that and he's slowly building up a people and he's still building up his kingdom and that kingdom is is good things are going to happen in that kingdom and we know that's true because we're told by isaiah that of the increase of his uh, government there will be no end so good things are happening despite us. And even the disciples who saw the dis transfiguration didn't really get it. it. The disciples we meet in the book of Acts, after spending a few weeks along with Jesus after the resurrection, they started to get it. And they're different men in Acts than they were in the Gospels. And that, that transformation is, is amazing. And we, we need to pray for a little bit of that transformation in our own minds. So yes, the more we can see the big picture of what God doing in history and the grace of God that allows us to be a part of what he's doing. He's made us citizens of the kingdom. He's allowed us to serve the, the kingdom. And he's promised that he's going to bring that kingdom to a, a very prosperous a conclusion one day uh, should inspire us to obey. Uh, we don't have to understand, just like, you know, the disciples. Um, maybe we'll get it uh, better uh, if we study a little bit more, but uh, we can still obey. We can still be faithful to kingdom, even if we don't understand it, even if we don't see the victory of God happening in today's world. Uh, God can change today's world, and we have to act in terms of that larger picture, and that larger faith. So, oh, go on, Martin. Sure. Uh, Cecil B. DeMille in his movie, his last film, put it very dramatically when he described Moses as one man against an empire. I think Dr. Shuni's commentary actually does good on that comparison. Not only is he standing against the empire of Egypt, which is the greatest power in the world that ever stood at that time, and their pyramids are still standing today, but he also ended up standing against Israel because he was a man without a country. God essentially alienated him both from Egyptian and from his fellow Hebrew so that he was only person he could rely on was God. And he uh, sometimes even had disputes with his brother uh, and sister, as uh, Numbers 12 makes clear. Uh, so, so he was a man alone. He, all he had was God. He had this in common with Elijah, who we spoke about earlier. Uh, they were both God's men and weren't in anyone else's pocket. And this conflict between Moses and the empire, where Moses was essentially the surrogate for God and speaking for God, uh, is a stupendous story. And it has tremendous dynamics that are significant for us today. And I think this is the reason that the book is valuable today. Uh, we can certainly read systematic theologies and institutes as a valuable book, no question about it. But there's something unique when Dr. Reshini gets his hands on a piece of biblical history, which opens things up. He cracks it open in such a way that we're seeing all the dynamics of what's going on back then. And its implications for today are huge. Almost every other chapter is saying, this applies to us today. This, this is an example again for us. And uh, we, I, I, I got, thought it was exciting reading throughout the read. I might play my third read through of the book. Uh, and it is exciting to read, and I think we get a lot out of it, because then we realize there's no such thing as a kingdom that God cannot level, so that a way is made for his word and his people to uh, make, their, make it through. It's just another mountain that God levels, like in Zechariah 4, uh, 6, you know, whole great mountain now should become a plain, or a mountain cr cracking in half in Zechariah 14. These things are things that God does. So every time we look and say, look how huge the UN is, or Russia, or China, or the US government, these are all things that God cracks in half routinely uh, because their mockery shall not stand. You know, they are not building on the rock. So unless the, uh, he who builds it, builds it you know, according to God's word, uh, it shall not stand. So I think one of the things that's really apparent when we talk about walking by faith rather than sight the book of exodus the bible in its entirety basically is making the statement that death is not normal 
pain is not normal. And yet we somehow think it is because in most of our lives, we've experienced other people dying, we've experienced pain. But I wonder how often, Mark, you think people relate the pain and the death to the original sin and that thanks to Jesus Christ and God's provision that we do have this hope that sin, death, pain have been conquered and will experience that victory. Part of the curse is the fact that uh, death is real and it's, and it's real to us. I, was, I preached a sermon a few weeks ago that when I, I referred to life and death and I, and I said, life and death is, is the, how we as Christians view it because we we've, have this understanding of, of life and it's preeminent. But for most people, they really experience it as, as the reality of death far before they understand the meaning of, of the life that's offered through uh, the gospel. So it's really death and life is the order in which we really understand things. And God has made death very real, very understandable to man uh, because the curse is very real very uh, uh, understandable. And that's why it's important that we believe in, for instance, the doctrine of the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection used to be commonly referred to. It was universally agreed to by, by Christians, but partly because I think of the, the influence of a, a dualistic form of, of Christianity and, and understanding of spirituality people now will question whether the resurrection is actually real or whether it's referring to just a spiritual resurrection. And uh, the resurrection and the conquering of death because of what Jesus Christ did is, is something that we have to revive and reemphasize that, that God is not a loser and he's not losing this, this battle of history to Satan. And our victory is not just a spiritual one and it's not an ethereal one where we'll be floating on a cloud, but, you know, we will be raised, our bodies will be raised, but changed uh, into something more fit for heaven, just as uh, Moses and Elijah were in glorified bodies in the transfiguration we referred to, and Jesus's body then appeared in a glorified form that uh, Moses and Elijah were already in, so our bodies will be changed. And more fit for heaven, but but our eternity will, I believe, be a very physical existence, and we will be back essentially in the position of what at the end of Revelation is described in terms of the Garden of Eden, and the tree of life is there again, and the Lamb is on the throne. So we're going to be in a very real place, and we'll have a real life of service like Adam and Eve, without sin and death. Any closing thoughts, Martin? I think we need to see that um, Israel, we are not much better than Israel. The Christian church today is very much as stiff-necked in its ways as Israel is, and we should pay attention to this comparison, not for our sake, and certainly for our children's sake. Uh, we have given away so many points as, as a uh, faith community uh, and dishonored God in so many ways, it is stunning that he still puts up with us. So he has a purpose in that, and I think uh, we need to realize that, that we, need, we have obligations. We have duties and responsibilities, and simply because we shirk them and seem to get away with shirking them doesn't mean that that's going to persist ad infinitum. So there's one thing that the book of Exodus lays out, and Dr. Rashtuni expounds on this, is that the liberty comes with responsibilities and duties that slavery is the easier path and that's why we dive into slavery so frequently we use the state as a surrogate uh, egypt to take care of us and uh, because we don't want to cut loose from that and then suddenly we're on our own just us and god but somehow that's considered a bad thing because we'd rather have the state take care of us than god take care of us well, the state makes a terrible God, he's, and it's terrible at taking care of us, but we'd rather have bad than, the, uh, than have 
God be served. So all the things that we see happening to Israel, we're told in 1 Corinthians 10, I've said it before, uh, and it's important. These are all in samples unto us. The things that they went through and that they did and they, the way they defied God or slacked off on God's law and paid prices for that, they are examples to us because we are prone to the exact same foibles and weaknesses and irresponsibilities that they are. We are uh, to be operating in terms of liberty and freedom, Christian dominion. Uh, it starts with dominion over our own sin before it extends anywhere else. And if we cannot even break the hold of sin on ourselves through the Holy Spirit and being faithful to him, uh, then we're going to be wandering in the desert for as long as Israel did, which will be a topic coming up soon when we get to the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then perhaps our children are going to have uh, rushed on these books to read and get excited about when we didn't get excited about it. And that's going to be a high price for us to pay. It's, it makes more sense for us to get on track now before we sink any deeper, because the first step they say when you're digging a hole is to stop digging. So that is less work, because there's no easy way out, but there is a way out, and God lays it out. And Exodus is a book that tells you how the hard way actually works, if it's God's way. And therefore, there's a huge lesson in it for us. And I certainly would commend this volume for anyone who'd like to read an exciting book, in my view, about the collision between God and man uh, as it came to focus in the life of Moses and the people of Israel and what it means for us today. Very good. So next time when we get together, we're going to dive into that book that everybody says when they're reading through the Bible, yeah, okay, well, you got to do Leviticus, but nobody understands Leviticus. And uh, Dr. Rushdini understood Leviticus, and I believe we'll have a quite a healthy conversation then. And I hope uh, not only do our listeners get a hold of the commentary on Exodus, but they'll join us next time as we dive into the book of Leviticus. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Chalcedon podcast. To learn more about the ministry of Chalcedon or to discover thousands of great Christian books, sermons, lectures, videos, newsletters, and more, just visit chalcedon.edu today.